So will Bitcoin be here in five years? Bitcoin will definitely, well, here, right here <laughs> in five years. I hope that Bitcoin will be here in five years. Um, I think nobody knows how big it will be, but I'm pretty sure that at tech conferences around the world, you will be able to buy stuff with Bitcoin in five years. So, um, you know, people, most people in the room probably know a bit about Bitcoin. I think it's becoming a little bit of a household word. Not really sure, but um, what, are the, what are the biggest misconceptions that are still out there about Bitcoin? I think Bitcoin is starting to go mainstream. I mean, it used to be when I just I talked to tech people, like the people at this conference, that you know, they would know maybe what Bitcoin was. I think the biggest misconception is still that it's some deep, dark, mysterious thing for kind of illicit markets. And I think that's a, that used to be a reasonable misconception. And maybe it really was actually a reasonable conception, because I think one of the first markets that Bitcoin was useful for actually was the, the black markets. I think we've evolved way past that and we see you know, huge companies like Dell Computer accepting Bitcoin for ordinary products that people want to buy. And so I think we're, we're quickly evolving from something that was a little bit shady to start to something that is much more mainstream, much more accepted, uh, it's much easier to use. So let's go beyond five years and think about 20 years from now. Um, what do you see the world like in 20 years, and where do you see Bitcoin's place in it? Do you see us still having different currencies? Will there be as many currencies out there? Will there be more currencies? I think... Uh, it's, I always hate questions about the future because I'm really bad at predicting the future. I actually have done a little experiment where I try to like make some predictions about what will happen in the next year and usually I get about half of it right and half of it wrong. So don't take your uh, picks on the horses. Then. Yeah, don't, don't, don't take me to the racetrack. I think I would do really badly. Um, you know, 20 years from now, I think the world will look mostly like it looks today. I, I think if you think of Bitcoin as being like the internet, if you go back 20 years and, and see what people were saying about the internet, I mean, a lot of those things have come true and yet the world today is pretty much like the world was 20 years ago. I mean, certainly we're all carrying around these wonderful little computers that we can, you know, talk to anybody in the world. I think in 20 years we'll be carrying around these wonderful little computers where you can pay anybody anywhere in the world immediately uh, using something like Bitcoin, either Bitcoin or, or some future kind of worldwide accepted global currency whether that will be dollars or Bitcoin or euros or some currency that hasn't yet been invented, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it will be Bitcoin. So we're seeing some of the first regulation of Bitcoin or the proposals for regulation. Um, what do you make of proposals out of New York, for example, or of the FCA in London saying that they're going to explore big big, sorry, the blockchain technology? Regulators have a hard job. I mean, regulators have to react to this new technology and try to fit it into, into laws that were passed 40, 50, 100 years ago. Um, and so it, it really is a struggle with them. And I think you see that in all areas of technology. I think since money and banking are probably one of the most heavily regulated kind of sectors, it's particularly challenging for Bitcoin. Getting regulatory clarity has been really important. And I think over the last year, year and a half, certainly in the, in the US and Europe, we've seen more regulatory clarity. We've seen organizations like the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, in the US come out with guidance on, if you were doing these certain things with Bitcoin, here are the hoops you need to jump through. Here's how we're going to regulate you. And I think that's been really incredibly positive for Bitcoin. Going forward, I think the challenge will be to not get over-regulation that stifles innovation. Right, is that going to kill innovation, excessive regulation? It could. I, mean, I, think, I think certain countries around the world uh, take a much stricter approach. Such as? Such as China and Russia have been very anti-Bitcoin recently. And it might just be part of the regulatory kind of framework that they work in where their first impulse is to ban something and then maybe if they think it's good, they'll allow it as opposed to more liberal countries where the first impulse is not to immediately ban something, but uh, to take a more wait and see attitude and then just correct any problems that arise. So 
What do you think uh, the future of mining is going to be? Do you see there being a uh, concentration of miners? And can you give a, just like a one sentence explanation for what a miner is? Yeah, 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 sure. So mining is the process of creating new Bitcoin. Okay, perfect. And I mean, that's the hardest thing for people to understand is that there's no Bitcoin company that controls it. It's, it's this open source software project where people all over the world are doing the work of validating the transactions and in exchange for doing that hard work of making sure that all of the transactions are valid they're awarded with brand new bitcoins and so that's the only way that bitcoins are created are through these miners um, mining is has has undergone a really rapid evolution from it used to be you could create bitcoins just on your desktop computer um, those days are long gone now you need specialized chips uh, we're seeing large-scale industrial mining. Uh, yeah. Is it just, is it just going to be concentrated in the hands of a few? I think that mining, the, the, the centralization of mining is going to go in waves. Um, right now we're seeing economies of scale for companies that you know, create huge numbers of, get, get these chips and then just create these huge mining farms in places where electricity is inexpensive. I think that once those chips become commodities and they're really inexpensive, you'll see it decentralize again. And I tweeted just the other day that, you know, it's getting cold in Massachusetts, and I love to see a Bitcoin mining electric blanket because the, the kind of, the, 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 the excess, the thing that you generate when you're creating Bitcoins is Bitcoins in heat. And it would make sense to have an electric blanket that, you know, use some electricity in a useful way, as opposed to just generating heat, to generate a few Bitcoins. So that would be like the opposite of burning money? It would be the opposite of burning money, <laughs> yes. It would be uh, creating money and, you know. But I mean, is this is still, you think that it, when the cost of the technology will go down, then you'll see the, you know, m more democratization, I guess? I think we will. I mean, you know, if you look way back at technology, you know, when, when I was in college, way back in the 80s, uh, we were right at the cusp of going from kind of mainframe computers to personal computers. And I actually worked in the, uh, I worked in the, the tech support place. And the biggest wave of tech support happened around the time our senior theses were due because people all over the campus would send their theses to this centralized laser printer to get it printed out. They would go to the computer center and pick it up. And that used to be what computing was like, right? It was very centralized. And then the PC revolution happened, and everybody had a PC. And I think a similar thing is going to happen with Bitcoin mining. I think these chips will become a commodity. I think we'll see them built into products, maybe electric blankets. Maybe that's a stupid idea, and that won't happen. Uh, maybe your cell phone, when it's recharging, will you know, generate a couple Bitcoins on the side. Who knows? Um, but I, I think it'll go in waves. Do you think Bitcoin, do you think we're going to have physical cash in the future? I don't think, I think we'll go past physical cash. I think, uh, you know, Ebola, <laughs> people being afraid of Ebola on their, you know, 10 euro notes, I think might become a real thing, right? I mean, all it would take would be one story of somebody catching some horrible disease by handling cash, and I think you'll see people kind of rush for the exits to a more hygienic and convenient way of transacting money. Okay, okay, but you know, on the flip side you have stories like Mt. Gox and other spectacular failures. Do, aren't, aren't, that, aren't things like that going to make people rush for the exits on Bitcoin and are there going to be more of those in the future? First, I think there will definitely be more of those in the future. I do not expect smooth sailing for the Bitcoin ecosystem. Um, and that's okay with me. I mean, I lived through the dot-com boom and bust, and, you know, pets.com was a spectacular failure. Uh, and yet, kind of from, from that chaos arose great companies. And I think the same thing will happen in the Bitcoin world. I mean, it's very much a startup culture. It's very much an innovation culture. So you have to expect lots of innovation, but also lots of failures. Um, and I think the thing that remains to be seen is, you know, who will be the great successes in 5, 10, 20 years? And I just, I think we don't know yet. So I'm going to get a little bit geeky on you here. Um, can you explain in layman's terms to the rest of us uh, what sidechains is all about? Why, why is that so exciting? So 
people are starting to think about using this global distributed public ledger, which is what Bitcoin is underneath. It's a ledger of all these transactions that have happened over time. And I think about other things that you could do once you have a global, secure public ledger. And side change is one of those interesting ideas of what you can do. And the notion is that I can take some Bitcoin and I can kind of lock them up in this global distributed ledger. And then I can move them to some other ledger for a while that maybe has much faster transaction times or maybe it has some other purpose completely. And then when I'm done, I can kind of move them back. And so we're using Bitcoin, the, the currency, as kind of the currency for these other applications that people are excited about building that they can't do on the main Bitcoin blockchain because it's just too experimental. I mean, at this point, you know, this is a $5 billion software project. When I got involved, it was a $30,000 software project. Um, and so we're very conservative about you know, the changes we make to the, the core Bitcoin code. So what can the core Bitcoin code or what can, what can the blockchain generally be used for other than trading currencies? What do you see out there in the future? Well, people are thinking about all sorts of different things. Everything from kind of maybe property transfers. So you can imagine if you've ever bought a house, you know that there's a title company that assures that the person selling you the house actually owns the house. And they'll do a title search to make sure that, you know... That and they'll charge you for that. And they'll charge you for that. And so if you think about it, right, a, a title for a house is just a ledger of who owned the house over time. And so you could put those kinds of records in the global distributed public ledger that is Bitcoin. And there's all sorts of you know, legal and maybe regulatory issues there, but there are people experimenting with that type of thing for houses or cars or other kinds of property. It gets really interesting when you start thinking about this notion of, of smart property, where uh, an internet-connected thing knows who its owner is and can kind of connect to the Bitcoin blockchain and know whoever can kind of sign this challenge is my owner. So people have thought about, you know, in the future having self-driving cars that are actually self-owning cars. Like nobody owns them, they just, they are. And then if you want to use them, you make a transaction in the Bitcoin blockchain and then that car knows, you know, you have the right to use me for this period of time. And so those are some of the kind of really interesting, wacky, way out ideas uh, that people are just starting to work on for what, what might be next for, for this global, secure, distributed ledger. So what is the key then to getting there? Um, is it regulation or something else? Regulatory clarity is important. And you know, I think a year ago, if you had asked me, I would say that that is the, the most important issue. Um, right now, I think the most important issue for Bitcoin businesses is actually interfacing with the, the fiat money, with the, with the banking systems around the world. A lot of Bitcoin businesses have a lot of trouble with getting and maintaining a banking relationship because the banks are really risk averse. They just, uh, you know, newfangled stuff is not kind of where banks go. They don't really have this innovation culture that is Bitcoin. Well, they don't want to give bank accounts to pot dealers who are now legal in states in the United States, for example. That's true too. And you know, the legal marijuana industry could possibly be you know, one of the big industries for, for Bitcoin. Maybe, we'll see. Tell uh, me more. <laughs> Well, yeah, I know there are people working on that. And that, that's the interesting thing about Bitcoin is, is it's permissionless innovation. So everybody is, I, I like to say, everybody is doing everything. So if there's an idea you think of for some interesting thing you might be able to do with money, like maybe giving uh, marijuana growers a way of actually charging their customers that doesn't involve storing huge piles of cash someplace where it can be stolen, there is somebody working on that already. So, I mean, what's the bank's role in this? I mean, are they going to have to accept it? Are they going to have to just kind of swallow it? Or uh, can, they, can they block it? They can block it. Um, at least they can block the, the... They can make it hard to kind of exchange dollars or euros for bitcoins. They can certainly make that process harder. It's really hard to completely stop it because... Bitcoin's a peer-to-peer -peer system, right? If I want to send you some Bitcoin and you want to give me whatever, uh, a product that you're selling, a service you're selling, or cash, it's, there's nobody in the middle to stop that transaction. 
So in the very long term, once people are getting paid in Bitcoin and are transacting in Bitcoin, I think that it is impossible to stop, but it could certainly throw up roadblocks in the short term. Is there some cool Bitcoin idea you've seen walking the halls here? There hasn't yet. I actually haven't had a chance to walk the halls. <laughs> Okay. Um, although I heard, that, I heard there is a very cool company, uh, I think it's BitX, is letting you donate uh, Bitcoin to help fight Ebola. And so that's, I, I love to see charity uses of Bitcoins. So that's probably my favorite. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's great talking to you. Thanks.